Good evening and welcome to Music Today. Thank you for joining me. This is Keitaro Harada. The concept of this show is to bring in an artist each episode and have a conversation with the artist about a performance we will all watch and listen together. The live component is very important because I encourage the viewers to comment and ask questions to the artists. Music Today is a bilingual show. The live streams during your evening will be in English, and the shows that broadcast during your morning time will be in Japanese for the fans in Japan. You're more than welcome to watch the Japanese shows too if you want to build up on your Japanese skills. And there's actually a subtitle button somewhere around here. After the show has aired, you can watch the show in Japanese and read it in English. Without further ado, I'd like to bring in our guest for tonight. Since we cannot hear you applaud, please do me a huge favor and use the comment screen at the bottom to put clapping emojis or you could write clap, clap, clap so that we know you're there and supporting and enjoying the show. Please welcome our special guest, Maestro Tito Munoz. Hey, Hi. how are you? How are you? you? Very good. good. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Doing well, thank well, you. Where are you quarantined right I'm, now? Uh, I'm in New York City in Queens, New York, uh, in mm -hmm. my little office. Fantastic. Well, I greet you from Tokyo, from the future, where it's super rainy right now. It's tons of rain. <laughs> We're completely stuck here, but it's, this is what it is. It's, it's the opposite here. We actually had some mm -hmm. nice weather for the past uh, few days, so it's been very, very good. Very good. Um, for our viewers, I just want to give sort of a um, background information of myself and Tito. We've been, we were first friends virtually on Facebook when Facebook came around many, many years ago while we were in college, and you know. In, in a very, I was trying to think of a common denominator of you and I, and it's interesting because we share two states that has been very important in our lives, Ohio and Arizona. Um, Tito, you were there, you were in Ohio first with the Cincinnati Symphony and then the Cleveland Orchestra, and I kind of followed your footsteps to, when I became staff conductor at Cincinnati. Then I was living in Arizona doing Arizona Opera and Phoenix Youth Symphony, and you came to Arizona the year that I was leaving so sort of very randomly but what a coincidence you know it's a it's a small musical world but it's very very cool that we're able to cross crisscross that way yes and share lots of wonderful meals in many different areas around the u.s um i want to share a, a favorite photo of the two of us which is <laughs> oh boy i remember that <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I do this your first season because I was I was there. I also did. Uh, oh, this is for Didi Khan um, when you oh, came yes. to the Arizona Opera. That's right. Um, well, that's when right. When I came us. to your to your to your to your rehearsal or performance, whatever. Mm -hmm. was, yeah, right. I think it was yeah one of the dress rehearsal, and then I also did another one of my Tito K um, duo conducting. Uh, you know, photo. This was when you came to Richmond Symphony. Um, I um, took photos of you when you guest conducted the Richmond that Symphony. An, that and was another another time we crossed paths because you were still uh, you were associated with the uh, Richmond Symphony yeah. still, right at that time. And then and you were associate, associate conductor, I guess it was the year. Yes. Conductor? Yeah. Yes. And then uh, and and resident photographer that night. So it was great exactly. And then this this these photos of you that I took, we, um, it was published in the airline magazine in Japan. It was um, on the Japan Airlines and ANA magazine. Um, so people, and then I wrote a few words about, you know, you and about the beauty of performance and the life of a conductor. Absolutely. And this is one of my favorite photo of you, which is not of you, but about you, um, which is the Ravel, Ravel concert that you did in Phoenix. I think was it was in, that was the very first time I ever conducted the Phoenix Symphony as a guest yes. conductor. Yeah. Yes. Wow. It's good, good memories. And I, you know, I just recall being there at all of your performances that week and just, you know, just cheering. I was like, come on, get this job. You know, we're rooting for you. So, so I was very happy with the outcome of it. But this is one of the photos I really treasure. Um, That's awesome. Them. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's very, very cool. Yeah. Of course. Well, before we get to um, the music part of our show, I just wanted, there are several um, viewers already, so I wanted to make sure I recognize them. Steve from your orchestra. That's right. He's one of our 
amazing percussionists. Saying one of my favorite quotes from a movie ever, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. You two guys are great because you just feel what is supposed to happen next. Super musical dudes. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that's Very. Great. Likewise. Um, we have applause from Linda, <laughs> yeah. the Arizona yeah. Opera Concertmaster. Dave Lake is a radio host in Savannah. Um, we have some, um, Phyllis is uh, also from Savannah Philharmonic and board member, wonderful patron for the arts. Conductor friend, Michelle. Michelle, also hey, Michelle. Also here. Um, Bo oboe Great. player, Bobby is here. Also a wonderful staff member from the Savannah Philharmonic Fences. Pat from Arizona. Wonderful. Hi, Pat. Uh, Ching, Ching Ching is here, oh, also Ching Ching, a conductor. <clears throat> Violinist Tiffany Chang, Cynthia Hale, Pat Lipkin Cole, and then Linda saying hello back. All right, so let's talk about Stravinsky. Tell us about this music and what it means to you. Well, okay, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. So, so interestingly enough, I, I um, I, I always had an affinity for Stravinsky's music. I think ever since I was a kid, everything ever since I was in in youth orchestra, um, mm -hmm. I was very lucky to have performed the Rite of Spring, the Firebird, the nineteen nineteen suite at least, uh, and Petrushka all in my high school years. So they, I was really? kind of engrossed in it with with the youth orchestras that I played in, mm -hmm. um, and so so that was um, I, that was always a favorite. And in fact, I I, I was. Um, an apprentice conductor. One of my earliest conducting experiences was as an, as an apprentice conductor with the New York Youth Symphony, mm -hmm. and Misha Santora was the music director, and he, mm -hmm. um, and so he was he was my mentor in that in in during that time, and um, and we did we played the Rite of Spring under him. Um, mm -hmm. I was also playing in the orchestra, even though I was an apprentice conductor, and I got a chance to actually go through the piece, um, uh, and I you know I must have been like 18 years old then so it was a really amazing uh, really wonderful yeah I mean it was a really wonderful experience to get to do that with this that huge orchestra and the whole thing mm -hmm. and it's a very very good orchestra too yes um, I was able to do some excerpts and things like that so I it's just a piece that I always loved and you know I think when you when you learn um, when you learn pieces in youth orchestra those particular pieces like just stay with you forever because you spend so much time on it. You spend months right. rehearsing it. You love it. You listen to all the recordings. All your friends are all like, you know, super nerdy about it. And, <laughs> and uh, so it's it's great. And uh, and so that that piece has always been like something I've always really really um, loved and wanted to do. And Stravinsky in general. And um, and it was actually I had several um, several moments in my career um, that I think were were sort of a combination of coincidence and. Mm -hmm you know, also just the fact that I, I love the music also, um, that kind of propelled me with that music. And, and mm. one, one of them was, um, my time at the, uh, Opera National de Lorraine, which is a mm -hmm. the job that I had before the Phoenix symphony. I was a music director of an opera house there in Nancy, France. And one of our first, my first two productions there actually was a production of the Rake's progress, um, mm -hmm. which is Stravinsky's masterpiece opera. And then um, a double bill ballet of the Rite of Spring with the, with a brand new choreography, and uh, Lenos with the mm -hmm. for the four four pianos and percussion version that was also a staged choreographed version. So the singers were all on stage in costumes. It was really far out and awesome. And and um, I had I had that as kind of a thing because it was brought all both were broadcast uh, in Europe on the radio and the whole thing and. Um, and then not too long after that was um, Pierre Boulez's last time um, ever stepping foot on American soil, actually, ended up being going to Cleveland to do a concert there. Um, and he had to back out because he had eye problems, his doctors, mm -hmm. and, uh, he had to take a rest. And so he actually canceled his two weeks of concerts. And I ended up stepping in for him for the second mm -hmm. of those weeks. And it was with, uh, with uh, mostly Stravinsky. It was Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms and the original Symphonies of Winds. Um, and so that was uh, another kind of, uh, you know, situation where I was recognized for that music. And so then 2013 happened, which is the centennial of the Rite of Spring. And mm -hmm. I can't even I can't even count how many Rite of Springs I got hired to do that that year. But one of them and my favorite, uh -huh. one, without a mm -hmm. doubt, was mm -hmm. um, with the Cleveland Orchestra doing the original Dijinsky choreography with the Joffrey oh, Ballet. Oh, that's and that right. was by far one of my most 
favorite moments ever in my life to do that um, because I, I was so uh, I had a very good relationship with the Joffrey Ballet and as well with the Cleveland Orchestra since I was assistant there previously. Uh -huh. um, and that orchestra that has such a tradition with that piece, they've recorded it so many times with like the greatest conductors ever, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. have ever lived. Um, so it was really humbling, but at the same time, um, it, it, it gave me a lot of confidence because I felt like I, you know, I, I had something to bring to the piece that I, you know, that because I had some experience with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the piece itself is, 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 uh, um, in a lot of ways, transformational to music. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Stravinsky had a, a incredibly unique language that he needed to express. He was super young, for, you know, and 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 ambitious, and um, and he had the support of of uh, Diaghilev and Stravin and mm -hmm. Nijinsky, and um, and and I think all of those things really, you know, gave him the opportunity to write something that was, uh, you know, one of the most monumental things ever written in Western classical music. Um, it's a very primitive um, kind of sound. It's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, very, very unique harmonies, but all very calculated and very deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, even the, the the sacrificial dance at the end, which when you first look at it, and I remember the first time I looked, I saw it, I was like, I don't know, 15 years old or something. <laughs> when I like, because I, I used to work at a, um, I used to work at a, at a sheet music shop, which unfortunately no longer exists, Padelson Music oh. House, which used to be right behind Carnegie Hall. And mm -hmm. it was like the last like old school sheet music shop where you walk in and you have to browse and it's all done pencil and paper. And mm -hmm. I spent about a year and a half working there. And I remember all the scores that I used to look at, you know, in my off mm -hmm. time during lunch, I used to just take stuff out and just, you know, spend time. And I remember seeing Stravinsky's, the, the sacrificial dance, especially the very first time. And I, mm -hmm. I just didn't understand it. It was just black, <laughs> time signatures that I didn't understand. <laughs> and then, and then, and then hearing it, I mean, I got a recording out of the Juilliard library and I remember listening to it. Um, and thinking how on earth is everybody able to like read this and do this and play this together and, and do it, you know, uh, so, so perfectly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was like my child, I remember used to used to, my challenge. I used to go home and just like, try to figure it out, try to count it out and mm -hmm. try to whatever, which, and I eventually did. I eventually was able to sort of figure out the rhythms, which is why when I got a finally a chance to do it in youth orchestra, I was like, mm -hmm. super ready. I was ready to like, <laughs> to, 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 to show everybody that I knew this piece. It was just, it was <laughs> did you record that time when you were in high school? I'm your sure, piece? I'm sure I have a tape somewhere of that. I have a reading where I did the, the last, you know, the, the end, um, the, the last few few minutes of it i'm sure i have it somewhere uh -huh. i'd have to go and like i have to ask my mom <laughs> i think my mom has it somewhere in her collection of stuff it'll be great to see a side by side of then and now i'm sure because for a lot of people <laughs> well let's take a quick look at from your most recent performance i um on youtube um where was this oh this was um this was an extremely memorable concert. This was uh, a last minute step in actually um, mm. the, with the um, Orquesta um, Filarmonica de Jalisco, um, mm -hmm. which is in Guadalajara, Mexico. And it is mm. an absolutely unbelievable orchestra. I was, mm. I couldn't believe how good they were and how incredibly energetic they were. And, um, and Marco Parisotto, who was the previous music director, uh, he, he, it was a, you know, back and forth last minute sunday night i got a call and then monday i flew to guadalajara and had my first rehearsal i think i guess on tuesday morning um and it was rachmaninoff's second piano concerto and the ride of spring and mm. this is the result it was a, one of the because they don't, they don't record their stuff so it was like somebody from the pr um department was just filmed on their cell phone but this is what, what <laughs> this is the the, <laughs> evidence, the evidence of this concert <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
¡Bravo! It's amazing watching you do Rite of Spring and in the the video that you had um on your web on your website for a long time with your orchestra in France this one you know I, I remember watching it so many times because it was just one of it, it you have such infectious energy with this music especially and you just you're just breathing breathing Rite of Spring that was actually a good performance too. The the, mm -hmm. the, one, in, the one in the pit. They they um, that the they really uh, they loved. Play. I don't think that orchestra had ever played it actually. I, I believe really? it, even though I don't think because it's a small group and and they you know they if they would do it they would do it in their if they would do it they normally wouldn't do it as as a ballet because the ballet is a separate organization. It was a unique time to do a collaboration. It was like a one you know otherwise they would be on stage and mm -hmm. actually our stage can't fit it and so there's no way they oh would i see it. um and so we actually did the reduced the jonathan mcphee version and that's because they allowed it at that point it they were allowing the those performances to, to take place so i uh, gotcha my, my, so my orchestra had never played it before which is kind of crazy uh for, for being a french orchestra too mm -hmm. uh, but they they loved it and and it was a, such a great um great experience to kind of because i was still figuring it out too i mean i had i had my own experience with it, of course but mm -hmm. uh, but it's 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 come a long way since even then. It's, <laughs> it's, you, you're always figuring new things out. Right, of course. Well, I want to make sure our um, audience knows where to find that video, which is at tiramunoz.com slash video, and it's on its website. Um, amazing, amazing performance of this Rite of Spring in the pit. So please go check it out. Um, I have wanted to share a few more hellos from our friends in town um, from the past or from the future. Oh, John Morris Russell from CCM. Oh. Daga is also watching from Arizona. And I see Kate also watching from Arizona. So this is wonderful. Um, we, I think Dave asked a question about how open our audience is in Phoenix to 20th, 20th and 21st century music. And you know, this is this is your language. Tito is one of the champions of contemporary music and what you do in Phoenix is so amazing. Would you just share a little bit about yeah, your activities sure. in Phoenix? Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as this particular question is is concerned, it's a good question. I I don't think it's it's that different than most places. I think yes, you're mm -hmm. going to have certain places that are going to be a little more conservative than others. I you know, I mean, I always feel like it's it's just a, a matter of how you how you present it and how you put it into context for people, you know? So in Phoenix, I do try to always either I'm talking about the piece before I do it, or I'm inviting the composer to Phoenix mm -hmm. to actually present about their own piece. Um, in the case of concertos, all usually all my, um, um, my soloists who play particularly wacky music, wacky out the 20th century, 21st century music. Um, they're usually pretty game to just, give some, you know, talk about it and give excerpts. And I usually do some banter. So for example, the beginning of the season, we did Andrew Norman's switch, his percussion control, mm -hmm. our principal percussionist. And so we had a whole thing in the beginning where he explained all the instruments and how it's all laid out and all sorts of, so I think I, I with, with, when, when people have, you know, something like that to grab onto, I think it's, it's really helpful. It's really helpful for people to understand that some music just is not meant to be melodic the way people think classical music is supposed to be there's a lot of sort of mm -hmm. that conceived idea of what it of what it's supposed to be um mm -hmm. but that you know music art music is 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 really varied and and it's its use and its purpose is also really varied um you know uh sometimes uh, the composer is is trying to express a particular kind of emotion and they're using a different language than even the players sometimes know they have to learn new techniques and new ways of playing in order to achieve those sounds. So I think inviting people into those sound worlds, it takes time for some people, of course, you know, not everyone's is, is, is a hundred percent with it, but I think you definitely get more of a, of a buy-in if you invite people to not even like it. I mean, it's, you can tell people it's okay not to like it. And that's sometimes that's also a, a really powerful thing. Um, mm -hmm. So in general, in Phoenix, it's been, it's been good. We do have some people who don't like it, fine you know but we we always i mean we we give everybody the masterworks and all of that of course we 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 try to be balanced about it um 
so 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 for me it's been it's been a pretty successful um time to 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 present some new music in phoenix and i should also say that in phoenix it's a very interesting town in that um a lot of people are um looking to kind of reinvent themselves in phoenix almost there okay know, a lot of transplants a lot of people who cut mm -hmm. sort of come from different places and so it's this it's this place that um you know, uh, pe people come to just just start afresh uh, in, in in a lot of ways, and I feel like that kind of mentality also co goes into the activities that they choose to pursue. And mm -hmm. so I feel like there are a lot of people who come to the orchestra who've just never come to an orchestra concert before, so they don't necessarily have mm -hmm. any preconceived ideas of what's supposed to be good and what's not supposed to be good. So I feel like I do have a little bit more way, particularly with younger people that come to our concerts, because we do have a particularly young audience compared to other orchestras. Um, yep. And so I can kind of give them myself and give them my music, mm -hmm. and, and generally that's pretty well received and pretty well accepted. Yeah. Well, and and also attests to your very open personality to young younger generation concert goers can relate to you more um and it's not like a very old maestro talking to younger you know crowd it's you know we we're, we're talking to the same age group which is always helpful in yeah, getting those I mean, yeah, same, same with you i mean it's uh, we we come from that this same sort of um ilk of, yeah. of, mm -hmm. of there's not only our age, but also like understanding how powerful and important it is to actually say something to the audience and actually have that relationship with uh, with with the audience even during the concert. Most definitely. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, your your journey at the Phoenix Symphony. Um, you've been their music director since 2014, um, having spent six years. How would you describe the development so far that you have done? And then what would you like to accomplish in the future seasons that you that's haven't great, yet? That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, it was my first American music directorship. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, that was a, it's, it's, it's been an interesting time to, um, for, I mean, for growth for myself, just learning the, the particulars about that, that job and, and the kind of relationship I, I need to have with a, an administration, for example, um, which is very different than Europe. Europe is is um, a little bit more, uh, so we say old school because it's it's th there's there's no fundraising, for example. There's no mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, re reliance on on donors and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the priorities of the organization are very very different. The kinds of things we can program, it, we can get away with a lot a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, we were able to get, get away with a lot more in Europe and, and, um, and I, I even remember the distinct differences between, cause I had done a lot of music director searches in the United States and very mm -hmm. few in Europe, but this particular one, I remember the, the process of, of interviewing for, for the job and, um, and the questions asked in Europe were completely different than the questions mm -hmm. asked in the United States. I mean, almost mm -hmm. none of the questions in the United States had anything to do with the music or the artistry. It was all about the community, all about, you know, all the, all the politi po politician type things, you know, that's, that's yes. sort of how these things go. And in Europe, all of it was about the music. I think I had one question about like, what do I feel about education? But in general, it was all just development of the orchestra, the repertoire. What do you think of Boeing's? What do you think of this? It was just all music um, because that was basically what they were hiring. They were hiring a, a chief conductor, essentially. That's the, the role. Uh -huh. um, so in Phoenix, it was, it was um, uh, I, you know, I had gone through a lot of uh, music director searches and um the process in Phoenix just felt very comfortable to me. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like the, the orchestra was in a positive place um, at mm -hmm. that point. Um, mm -hmm. They had gone through a lot of um, a turmoil before, but they were at that point in a really positive upswing. And I felt like that was something that I, I wanted to be part of and, and help propel if, if I could. Um, and I felt like it was, it was at, at that time, it was, it was for me a, a good time to start with an orchestra of this size, this caliber and all mm -hmm. of that, you know, some, a, a full time, an Ixam orchestra, something that was a little bit, you know, more prestigious and, um, and luckily they agreed, luckily they thought the same. So they, mm -hmm. they offered me the job and, um, and, and since then it's been really great to, um, I think instill a culture of whatever, you know, my priorities are in music making, which are, you know, that, that, that intense listening, um, mm -hmm. the rhythm, the listening across the stage, all of those things that I try to, I, everywhere I go, that's always like my goal. And, and, and mm -hmm. so 
So to have a group that's that's good and uh, that's mm-hmm. really good and and to work on those things, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, um, um, has been really wonderful. And um, and you know, it's interesting. I think you, you go through you always go through growing pains because mm-hmm. orchestra being with an orchestra is, is a relationship. It's a it's a um, you know, I, I make mistakes, um, as a leader, everybody does. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and you try to learn from them. It's also really difficult because as a conductor and a music director, you don't really have the kind of interaction with an orchestra out off the podium that you normally would want to have, because it's not, the system's not set up that way. You know, when I see the whole orchestra, the only time I see them is in rehearsals on the podium. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so there's usually not an, and there's usually not enough rehearsal time. And so there's usually not Mm -hmm. enough time to spend just talking just just getting to know people just what do we think about what this is what do we think about what what our lives are like in this job right now you know there's a lot of i think really important things that could happen if there was mm-hmm. more of that kind of dialogue but it's really hard to do in 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 the setup that we have um, yeah. one of the things that i think this lockdown has has forced mm-hmm. us to do is have that is actually have a little bit more of a of a dialogue which has been really really healthy in a lot of ways um, is 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 sort of reprioritizing what what this all means and what it means for us and what our relationship means and how important it is. Um, mm-hmm. So so in addition to the new music that I've done, I've done a lot of really really great new music and brought a lot of um, you know I think really interesting soloists and and all of that. Our education and health and wellness and outreach has really. Um, been a, a wonderful transport formative experience for a lot of a lot of folks in our in our constituency musicians board mm-hmm. people receiving it um we have a lot of nationally recognized um, um initiatives and that had to has to do certainly with uh, our former ceo and and the administration that has spearheaded a lot of those things and i think that's been a really really wonderful thing um mm-hmm. It's good. I mean, orchestras are big and cumbersome organizations. And so um, being able to do the things that we've been able to do is is, is all I, I feel have been really meaningful for me. And I'm, I'm very proud of it. What are some future plans with the orchestra that you think ideas that you're able to share that you might want to do yeah. moving forward? Sure. I mean, I, I mean, just artistically, uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm hoping one day we'll be able to do some concert opera, um, and and mm. that we haven't, we haven't, and uh, for, for two reasons: one, out of respect for Arizona opera, you know, which mm. you're associated with, mm-hmm. I want to make sure that well, whatever we do is something that we work on uh, together in some way, because I, 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 I love Arizona opera, and I love the people that work there, and I, and I mm-hmm. have a lot of respect for them, and so I want to, you know. But it's also very expensive. Even doing a concert version of an opera is also very expensive. So that's something that right. I'm hoping eventually to 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 do um, with the symphony. Um, there are a lot of new music projects that I have in, cooking up in my head that I would mm-hmm. love to do. And that's that's we'll see. Um, mm-hmm. But unfortunately, you know that that's a big 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 issue now is because of the coronavirus. Um, a lot of orchestras are having to scramble or not, or they're just kind of stuck in this limbo situation right now, not really knowing what September is going to look like. And that's right. really scary for a lot of us because we're not for profits. We, mm-hmm. you know, we, we are fragile organizations, every single one of them. And sometimes the bigger you are, the harder you fall, you know, it's one of those things. So um, it's, it's, it's really tough. And so I think um, right now is going to be a summer of reimagining a lot and um, reimagining with sort of the 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 narrative that's going on in this in the in the country right now and the and the, mm-hmm. the feelings that are going on in the in the United States right now. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think uh, and and sort of a segue into that is sort of uh, diversity, inclusion, mm-hmm. uh, and equity are, are things that I that I've always held dear and I'm and I'm hoping that's going to be something that we um, really make really make a strong part of our identity uh, moving forward because there are a lot of really wonderful um, artistic endeavors that we can do uh, that should include more people um, and all different kinds of uh, backgrounds. Definitely. And you you touch upon subjects that I definitely want to come to in a moment. Um, Before we move on, I'm also um, introducing some hellos from wonderful oboe players. We have Marianne and Tiffany, so back-to-back oboe, oboe hellos, hellos back. Um, Tito, one of the um, music that um, I always admired of your performance was this um, 
the Vivaldi Four Seasons pro pro that you did. Can you tell us just a little bit about that and um, what what this was about? Sure. Um, this was um, really cool. Um, uh, the, I mean, the, the performance itself was great. Um, uh, as far as the 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 amb I mean, yes, the, the performance was great too. But the ambiance was really um, special because it was at Le Poisson Rouge in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. It was um, with a, a, a pickup ensemble, but there's a lot of people that I know. In fact, if you know the composer Caroline Shaw, mm -hmm. she's playing she's playing in the back of the second violin for this performance. This was right before she won the Pulitzer and became one of the most. <laughs> Just yeah. about, just about like three or four months before she won that prize, she played this mm -hmm. concert. Um, anyway, um, uh, Max Richter, who is a um, kind of in the in the minimalist vein of uh, Philip Glass, uh, kind of you know uh, type of thing, he was tasked with uh, doing a recomposed Vivaldi Four Seasons. Um, this was actually a Deutsche Grammophon project of many composers, not just the Vivaldi, and they asked many modern composers to reimagine old masterworks. So he was okay. asked the Vivaldi. And so okay. he created this really wonderful um, kind of just reimagining in his own voice of the Vivaldi. And so Daniel Hope had done the world premiere and the world premiere recording. And this okay. was the American premiere and CD release uh, of that performance. And so at Le Poisson Rouge, and it was just a just a lot of fun to be able to do and do with Max Richter, who's actually playing uh, the keyboard and electronics. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's not only is the music amazing, but also the video work of this is so cool that it really transfers your, you know, as a viewer, puts you into that spot and be part of that music making. It's yeah. Well, we were, we were, we were all. Like, we were all like that close to each other too. I mean, <laughs> exactly. What it felt like it was because is a nightclub, and so and the stage mm -hmm. is tiny. It's this triangle, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. so basically, what you see on stage is like the max I could possibly fit on that stage, and with like mm -hmm. that camera in the back. So it really, kind of, it was. But it was. It's great. I mean, it was. It was super hot. They have to. The air conditioner they have is this industrial air conditioner, so they have to turn it off when they do the concerts, and so they blast it right before, and then they turn it off. And so we're all like, especially me, because I really sweat when I conduct. I'm like. <laughs> ripping but the entire time <laughs> but you know but it's one of the, it was one of those just a really fun magical um magical experiences because daniel daniel's amazing he's such a beautiful player and yeah. he was fun to work with fantastic well i highly encourage everyone to go check it out it's on tito's um youtube channel i think and such an amazing performance so um i i do want to come back to our dialogue about reimagining and understanding the current situation and the temperature and the culture that we are in, in especially in the United States. Um, tell us about how Black Lives Matter means to you and how it influences or how it will continue to influence your musical activities. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, you know, it, it's it's really obviously very tragic what's happening now um, in certain ways, of course, the, the tragedy of, of the murder of George, George Floyd, um, among countless others. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, but also um, uh, in a lot of ways, um, I think our country and our world are finally waking up um, mm -hmm. to the idea of uh, systemic racism. And and that's something that, you know, I I have experienced in certain ways all my life. I mean, I am a person of color. I'm, I'm Hispanic. I'm uh, South American. Both of my parents are from South America. Um, but I grew up in New York, uh, which is a very diverse place and um, spent a lot of time in a lot of different places, a lot of different countries, a lot of different states. And so I certainly have my own experiences with that, that I that I, you know, f deal with in my my own way. Mm -hmm. um, but I am also somebody that works a lot with um, organizations like the Sphinx organization. I'm a product of of many um, programs such as the Music Advancement Program in in. Uh, New York at the Juilliard School, um, which is uh, in, in certain ways an affirmative action program. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of it. Actually, I'm very mm -hmm. proud of the education that I got and the teachers that I had and the mentors that I have. A lot of them that I still connect with now and still um, uh, are, are I'm very close to. And so um, so this is something that's on my mind and it has been on my mind. And I, I, I know it's an important dialogue that we all need to be having. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of the things for me that's really um, that, that I'm seeing and that makes it very, I think makes the dialogue a little bit more difficult is mm -hmm. that 
change in in a society and change in a mindset um obviously it takes time right it, i mean everything right. that you everything anytime that you want to change a perception of something there's a there, there there's a process there's mm -hmm. stages that people go through um to to even begin to believe something even to begin to 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 see it for 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 what it is um and before social media before people had instant communication with each other instant mm -hmm. you know random people just having communication with each other um mm -hmm. you know people were able to do that kind of understanding uh and that process at their own pace wherever they were um right it's it's the same with grieving right when you grieve you have different different stages of grief before you kind of accept it and you're able to live with it um but mm -hmm. there's a lot of pain and a lot of anger and all sorts of different emotions and i think change with a really hot topic and a really hot especially a, po a politicized topic also mm -hmm. has that those stages of of emotion that need the people need to to go through they need to have that that ability to 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 share with others to share with their peers to to observe on their own time however wherever they are and i think the fact that we have this instant constant instant dialogue with each other um mm -hmm. among people who aren't ready for each other if mm -hmm. that makes sense you know you have people yes. in one place where they might be going through one process or they would go through only through one process without this constant bicker bickering and then somebody else who maybe has a different viewpoint. And so mm -hmm. because we're in this situation, um, I feel like that um, kind of adds fuel to the fire almost. And it makes people mm -hmm. even more, more polarized because they're so adamant in their beliefs and they want to be more adamant in their beliefs. Right. Um, the silver lining for me is that there's there are more people believing in what we're protesting about there are more people uh -huh. believing in the systemic racism there are more people seeing it for what it is and and there's change there's we were seeing uh -huh. action being taken which for me i personally feel very good about I'm, I'm happy that there's finally more of this dialogue and more of this talking and more of this change going on and i think that is going to be the catalyst for a lot of organizations like orchestras to start to rethink how they do business and how they uh, address this very issue. Because, um, you know, uh, for an orchestra like Phoenix, for a, an orchestra like the New York Philharmonic, I mean, the, we, we, are, we live in different places, mm -hmm. um, but the issues are the same. Uh, right. they're, they're, they're the same issues. They go, they're dealing with the same stuff. And so I think um, that's going to be definitely on our minds as we start to plan for whatever september is going to bring um mm -hmm. and i'm glad because i think these are things now that our board of directors are going to be able to 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 really sink their teeth in and try to make change um our administrations are going to sink their teeth into and try to make change because now it's part of the national narrative and now it's part of uh the dialogue that everybody's having mm -hmm. i feel that you know we've both been in organizations and that tends to do um, could feature African-American composers just on one program called during the Black History Month. And, and, and that's, you know, in retrospect, that is so wrong because why just only isolate one concert during the 54 weeks and not many other concerts no. Well, there's well, there's there's a lot of great music, and there's a lot of great music that isn't being performed, and I think that's you know, and uh, and I, that's something that I've I've been also trying to do in Phoenix to try to incorporate more. Um, you know, we were very proud that we were one of the, um, if not the first orchestra mm -hmm. since the Chicago Symphony to do the Florence Price Third Symphony on a subscription concert, as far as major orchestras are concerned, mm -hmm. uh, which which we did last season in a concert with Jesse Montgomery and and we mm -hmm. I mean and and there are a few Julia Perry a few other uh, composers that we we featured um, and that I, that I try to feature um, uh, on a regular basis and I think um, that's a start I think that's yes. a, that's a, that's a beginning um, we still don't reflect that on stage mm -hmm. we, we don't we still don't don't reflect that in the boardroom we still don't reflect that on in the administrations uh, that's just a reality we still don't have right. I mean there there are some Hispanic conductors um uh, we don't have enough women we don't have enough african-american conductors there's no mm -hmm. reason for that I, I don't think i think we have mm -hmm. um we have uh, a lot of 
uh, talented folks who are who are out there um, working. And it's funny, I just watched um, one of our colleagues, Roger Cox, who just mm -hmm. did a, a talk with a, a few of few of his colleagues. Yeah, and um, that was an amazing session with the four of them. Oh, it's them. incredible, especially the, the, yeah. the minds of Michael Morgan and uh, Thomas mm -hmm. Wilkins. Thomas Wilkins, Jonathan, and, uh, Jonathan Hayward. Hayward. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and wonderful, talented, super smart, and um, but 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 hearing them, hearing their experience, hearing mm -hmm. their 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 history with all of this, you know, the fact that the four of them are sitting there and they can laugh and joke about the fact that they make their most money in February. Why? Because Black History Month. Exactly. You yeah. know, and, that, and that's and it's and it's sad. I mean, it's very sad, but that's that's the truth. But um, mm -hmm. and so I think you know, there's a lot of work to do, and I'm glad that the dialogue is is going there now, and that we're able to talk about it more openly. We're able to have those di that dialogue with our with our people, with our constituents, um, mm -hmm. and that hopefully there's going to be real sub substantive change um, in the future. I know at least on my part there will be for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that that's going to be a nationwide, even worldwide uh, situation. Yeah, very, likewise. You know, as as conductor in a community, we are in many ways the arts leader of our our town, and it really takes the courage and the leaderships that we have in act to act with this newfound responsibility. So I hope that everyone, you know goes in that direction and that we we're going to see wonderful changes and I think we will. I think yeah. I think um, I think I think there that we're 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 prepared now. I think I mean prepared mm -hmm. in the sense that now that because this is a national dialogue I think there's 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 an opportunity. I think we we're, we're, we're going to be able to to actually take the and the and and people should. I mean I hope they do. Yes, of course. Um, my final question for you today Tito is Back to COVID-19. So performing music has become such a routine activity for us for so many years. It's, you know, we didn't really think about it, but we always had a performance. And that's sort of what we defined us as performers, that we always had an opportunity to perform for an audience. Then all of a sudden, because of this world crisis, performing in public has become extremely difficult. How has your attitude towards music and performing for an audience changed? That's a good question. I miss it. Um, I, you know, I, I honest. Think, I think, yeah. I think um, that's the one thing that I think all of our, especially you know, being with um, virtually with our orchestra members. You know, one of the things that I'm really, really proud of um, is um, how how thoughtful all of our musicians are in the Phoenix Symphony. Really, really, really mm -hmm. thoughtful and and. We had a, a a moment. Not everybody was able to join, but we had a moment last week where we we did as a collective with just the players and myself a uh, eight minutes and forty six seconds of silence together, um, in honor of George Floyd. We did it over Zoom, and it's funny because you know one of my my players brought the idea up to me, Alex Lang, our principal clarinet, mm -hmm. clarinetist, and um, and he put it in the context of, and it just it was a beautiful it, the way he put it into context. It's it, it's no different than a four minutes and 33 seconds of John Cage. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a certain kind of music making that can happen with silence, with the music, with the, with the ambiance in the room, in the virtual room in this, in this yeah. space. Um, <clears throat> and so he was like, well, why, why don't we try that? And why don't we put it into the guise of actually let's make music together, which is this kind of just emotional being just, just be, let's be together in, in a space. Cause that's the only real music making we can do synchronously on zoom. Cause otherwise there's <laughs> latency and all of that. We can't really do anything. <laughs> that, that is true. <clears throat> so, so we did, and it was really, really wonderful to see um, so mm -hmm. many people participate and uh, and then we had a we had a we just talked we just opened up afterwards and just spent some time sharing our feelings and sharing what all of this feels like and what all of this means and mm -hmm. one of our players was really um um <clears throat> said said an interesting thing you know they were saying how you know right now because we're all stuck at home it's very lone it's a very lonely time i mean some people who don't have spouses significant others you know they they're they're on their own and and um, and they're doing the best they can, and you know, being alone is 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 tough, right? And 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 then having this tragedy on top of it, making it even tougher. Um, mm -hmm. But the fact that we were able to kind of meet together, and she was able to hear from people who shared her views, who shared her emotions, who shared her feelings, um, made her feel less alone. And that was a really, you know, very 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 um, 
um, wonderful and uh, moment to, to, to share with everybody. And I think um, one of the things we all realize we're missing so much is that aspect of, of being with people and performing for them, because that's what music is. It's this communication with an audience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've done recording uh, as a player, and I, I know a lot of my colleagues have done recording, and it, that's, and it's all well and good, but it's not, it's not the same. I mean, it's not the same right. of, of getting up in front of a stage and, and presenting your voice in your way, not an engineer's yeah. way, your way, um, and, uh, and, and, and having an audience respond in, in the immediate. Um, like with any performer, I think when everybody knows that there's a give and take and there's a back and forth between uh, audience and performers. So, yeah, I miss it, and I'm and I'm I can't wait till. You're lucky, man. You're gonna get to do it sooner than me. So, you know, yeah. the situation in Japan is a little bit different. I have my a concert next week without audience, and then starting July with audience. Right. So, I mean, but, a lot of places, Europe, Europe are, are a lot of places in Europe are doing it. I had a colleague. Um, uh, Jimmy Gaffigan, not the comedian's oh. conductor, um, mm -hmm. uh, for our, uh, for our, your audience right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, J uh, James Gaffigan is a close friend of mine and he, um, he, he's in Norway right now cause he lives there with his wife. And so they were key, they were kind of calling on colleagues in Norway to see who could come and conduct cause they were opening up and that, so he conducted a concert even like a month ago, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with 50 people in the audience, but it was a concert. And he said, in some ways it was just one of the most beautiful experiences. In other ways, it was really bizarre and strange because everybody was so spread apart and there were only 50 people. And, um, but this is a weird new normal for us right now. Yeah. Well, music is still music and we need our audience to share the love of music that we have. So it's hope we, the only thing we can do is hope, hope for a better situation coming forward. I think we're all going to, it's going to be interesting how the fall season comes around and how a lot of orchestras, especially in this country, react and act upon the situation. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're doing, um, you know, you, you, with your concerts, you have a, a yeah. setup already with the two concerts. I mean, Leonard Slatkin put out a blog recently where he suggested certain scenarios. I mean, you know, we're going to have to adapt and every orchestra is going to find their way of doing that. Um, yes. and, and safely and, and, you know, safely. And that's the most important exactly. thing. And, and, uh, and so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Well, Tito, thank you so much for your time. This was a great opportunity to catch up with you and to share, you know, our conversations with many of our friends and fans. And for those who are watching, thank you so much for your time and come back again tomorrow. I'm, I'm doing this almost every day at 9 PM Eastern standard. Thanks, Tito. Thank you. And to everyone, have a good night. Thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe, like, and share this video. Arigatou gozaimashita. Channel 登録, いいね, そしてこのビデオをぜひシェアしてください.